Hey everybody, welcome to All the Math. That's all the math you need for computer science. This is Volume 1, Discrete Mathematics, and this is Episode 1, Introduction. And all I want to do in this introduction is give you a little bit of a taste for what discrete mathematics is and what it encompasses. And we're going to do that by breaking down the two words in the title, discrete and mathematics. So let's start with discrete. Uh, but first of all, a spelling knit. You know, there are some people who spell the word discrete like this. Now that is a word, and that will pass spell check. It's a word which means careful or inconspicuous, uh, circumspect. We might say that we want to discreetly warn someone that their fly is open because we want them to be able to zip up their pants, and we don't want to call them out and make them all embarrassed, right? That's where we get the word discretion from, okay? It's not what we're talking about in this class. We're not going to be talking about discrete mathematics in the sense of being careful or sort of delicate about it, right? What we're going to be talking about is discrete in this sense, D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E, -E, which is a different word entirely. Interestingly, they have the same root. But the word discrete, which we're going to talk about, really means to be separate or distinct or compartmentalized. And like many words in the English language, I think the best way to understand it is to contrast it with its opposite. What is the opposite of discrete in the sense that we're going to use it? Well, the opposite is continuous. So discrete versus continuous is sort of a dichotomy that comes up in mathematics. And really, this course focuses more on discrete entities rather than continuous entities. So to sort of get an idea for what that is, uh, let's come up with some examples. So one way I think of discrete is in terms of fried eggs. Okay, so uh, in the morning, you know, my son Johnny gets up and he's uh, sometimes a hungry guy and I might say, hey Johnny, uh, you know, how many fried eggs would you like this morning? Because he likes fried eggs. And he might say, well, daddy, you know, I really just want one fried egg this morning. Or maybe some morning he's a little hungry and he wants two. Maybe some mornings he's really famished, comes up, he wants, you know, 11 or 12. Uh, but at any rate, I'm going to make a certain number of fried eggs on my skillet for him. What Johnny's never going to ask for, though, is two and a half fried eggs. He's never going to be able to say, uh, hey, Daddy, can I have 3.24 fried eggs this morning? Because I can't make that, right? You either get a fourth one or you don't. You can either have three fried eggs or I can make you a fourth one. You can either have two fried eggs or I can go ahead and give you a third one. But I can't give you half a fried egg because it just doesn't work that way, right? So that's a discrete quantity. By the way, it would make perfect sense for Johnny to say, you know, Daddy, I'm really hungry enough for about two and a half scrambled eggs this morning. Because scrambled eggs, you see, are a continuous quantity. I could take a dozen eggs, I could break them all, put them in a bowl, stir them up with my whisk, and I could pour them out and, and you know, cook my eggs. And then maybe I give one person about three scrambled eggs worth, another person three scrambled eggs worth, other person isn't quite so hungry, so I only give them two and a half scrambled eggs, and then maybe the final person's Johnny, I give him three and a half scrambled eggs, right? So scrambled eggs can come in any quantity, unlike fried eggs, which only come in integer units. Now, discrete doesn't always mean integer, but this essentially gets the point across that when we talk about fried eggs, there are a certain finite, and it doesn't always have to be finite, but in this case it is, a certain finite number of different values the number of fried eggs can have. Whereas scrambled eggs, someone could conceivably ask me for 4.936244435902 scrambled eggs, and I would be able to satisfy that request if I could measure it accurately, because there is fundamentally something called that number of scrambled eggs, because that's a continuous quantity. So let's make a list here of some different things that we can put in this category of discrete versus continuous. So here we're going to say one thing in the discrete category is fried eggs. And over here in the continuous category, we have scrambled eggs. Another common illustration for this would be over here in the discrete category, we might have stair steps. If you're going from one floor of the house to another, we can go up the stairs, or we might take the escalator. Same sort of property here, because stair steps, I can go up four steps, and then take the fifth, and then take the sixth, and if I measure my altitude at any point in time, it's always going to be some even number of stairs. Whereas the escalator is smoothly varying over that entire range, and so I might be 4.3965 feet above the bottom floor at any particular time. That's another example of a uh, discrete versus continuous quantity. 
If you're thinking in terms of programming, those computer scientists of you out there, you might recognize that one data type we use when we store discrete variables is a data type called int, at least in languages like Java and C and C++, there's something called an int. Whereas over here in continuous land, we might use something like a float or perhaps a double. So an int is used to store quantities which have some integer representation where we are going to store either five or six or negative three, but never negative 3.2, whereas a double can be any value. Now, it's sort of interesting when you look at uh, the way things are represented in a computer, it's actually not that way, right? Uh, even doubles in a computer are represented in discrete fashion, and that has to do with the fact that the memory size and the way that information is stored on a computer is always stored in a discrete way. And so, you know, you might say, well, what's the stop me from having a program where I say double T equals 4.299334653552201936. Uh, can't I have any amount of precision that I want? The answer is actually no. Once you get to a certain number of decimal places, the compiler is either going to throw an error or the compiler will decide to say, you know, any digits you put past this, I'm basically just ignoring because I can't store stuff that precisely. So essentially, the computer fundamentally being a digital computer is something that uh, can only store a finite number of values. But for practical purposes, you know, in terms of the spirit of the thing, we do use a double or a float or... Um, data types like that to store continuous quantities and things that we know have a finite number of values uh, we use in n. So that's another example. Now, if you're more on the math side, you may recognize this symbol. Uh, I draw these things a little bit this way. Uh, this is a Z that's kind of written in a script type fashion over here. And I'm going to contrast it over here with this R that's written in a script type fashion. In mathematics, they use this symbol to mean the integers, or really what they mean is the set of integers, as we'll discover uh, when we talk about sets, which is going to be one of our upcoming units. But the integers are essentially all the numbers, which are whole numbers, negative, positive, and zero. But real numbers is what we use to basically say any number at all on the real line, as long as it's not an imaginary number or a complex number which is a different thing, but a real number is capable of having a value like 3.292 or pi or e or some number which actually doesn't have an integer representation or possibly not even a rational representation. So that's another discrete versus continuous comparison. If you look at the world of electronics, of course, this is a word, word that comes up a lot in our world. Everything's going digital, right? What's the opposite of that? Well, the opposite is really analog, and you may be used to thinking of this in terms of a clock, like a digital clock versus an analog clock. And a digital clock is one that has actual digits on it that, you know, click second by second and you can kind of read it off just like that. Whereas an analog clock has hands. And those hands sometimes click, click, click like a second hand, but you've also probably seen clocks where the second hand just smoothly goes around. And certainly the minute hand and the hour hand are going to smoothly move around. That's an analog clock as opposed to a digital clock. In general, what these words mean is, is the information held as a continuous quantity or as a discrete quantity? If it's an analog quantity, it might be something like, well, we're going to measure a waveform, which is essentially nothing more than a sound. Maybe someone's singing or playing an instrument and we want to record them on a cassette tape. What we're doing is we're recording a continuous quantity in that case. We're going to be you know, recording a magnetic signal, and that signal is going to basically be going up and down exactly in tandem with the way that the air currents are moving back and forth because of the vibrations of their voice or the vibrations of their instrument. And we're going to be recording that exact sound wave in all its detail, and maybe it looks something like this. And when we play that back, it sounds like, you know, an opera or it sounds like Led Zeppelin or whatever. Well, in the digital world, what we do is we say, let's take that very same waveform, but let's actually sample it at different points. And so maybe every few milliseconds, we're going to measure what is the air displacement of this wave. And we're going to measure what that is in terms of the force it has. And we're basically going to be recording a bunch of distinct measurements, which essentially is this waveform over here, but in a different form. 
And that is called digitizing or making a digital representation of it. And essentially what we've done is we've taken, again, a continuous quantity, a smoothly varying quantity, which we had from the headphones or from the microphone or whatever it is we're recording with, and we have said, let's turn it into a discrete representation by simply recording the value of it at specific points in time. So we've essentially taken scrambled eggs and turned them into fried eggs, if you were. All right, another example from mathematics. We'll see this symbol a lot uh, this semester. This is uh, sort of a scary looking Greek letter. It's a capital sigma. And you may have seen this before. It's a sum sign, you know, so we'll see things like, you know, what is the sum uh, as, you know, I goes from one to N of, you know, I squared or something like that, right? This sum is a way of saying, let's just add up all the elements. If you haven't seen that before, don't worry about it. I just want to kind of draw the connection between that and something you may have seen in calculus, which is this symbol. And that, of course, is the integral sign, those of you who have had calculus. And, you know, you may see something down here, like let's integrate from 0 to 5 uh, up here. These are exact analogs of each other. These are exact comparisons. The version of adding things up with a sum in the discrete world is exactly the same as integrating things in the continuous world. Instead of saying, let's add up a finite bunch of distinct quantities, which is what we do with the sum symbol over here, what we're going to do in the continuous world is say, let's add up a continuous number of infinite tiny little pieces in order to get a sum. But you can even tell that this little, you know, swooping thing kind of looks like the sigma if you squint a little bit hard, and that's why those things go together. But this is essentially nothing more than the continuous version of this discrete thing over here, which is the sum symbol. One more example, those of you who are into uh, science, uh, you've probably heard this word a lot floating around our culture, the word quantum or quanta, and you've probably heard of quantum mechanics. And one thing that uh, was discovered that really shattered a lot of people's view of the universe, pretty much everyone's view of the universe, a hundred years or so ago, was that it was discovered that certain things, particularly energy, come in so-called quanta. And what that means is that you can have, you know, a, 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 a material body, that has a certain heat or something like that, has a certain amount of energy. And you might say, well, I can measure how much energy this light bulb is giving off, you know, every second. And, and you might think that you could have any amount of energy you want. You might think, well, you know, I could have a really, really bright light bulb, or I could have a not so bright light bulb, or I could have one a little bit brighter than that, or I could have one less bright than that. You know, certainly the energy of a light bulb, that the energy of the being emitted, certainly seems like a continuous quantity. Well, it turns out not so that when you actually go deep, deep, deep into the bowels of physics, what you discover is that the amount of energy something can have is actually a discrete quantity. That there are these tiny, tiny little packets, so-called, of energy, which are called quanta. And it turns out that you can have a light bulb that emits five quanta, you can have a light bulb that emits six quanta, but you cannot have a light bulb that emits five and a half quanta or 2.793 quanta. Everything in terms of energy comes in some deterministic definite number of these discrete packets, and you cannot have any of the decimal numbers in between. That rocked a lot of people's world, still rocks mine, because it doesn't seem like it should be that way. But anyway, that's the quantum revolution in physics, is when people realize, scientists, that some of the things at the lowest microscopic levels of inquiry really did behave like uh, discrete quantities. That's to be contrasted over here in the continuous column. I will put the word, there's another science word you may have heard, continuum. Einstein talked about the space-time continuum, and you probably can easily recognize that there's a relation between that word and that one. Continuum and continuous really go together. And what a continuum means is that there is some quantity, for instance, space or time, if we measure what time something occurred at, or we measure what something's x, y coordinates are when it happened. Turns out that those things do, in fact, vary continuously throughout a range. And so I can be, you know, 5.346 miles from my house, or I could be 5.347 miles from my house. There's no limit to how granular I can get in that measurement because it is, in fact, a continuous quantity. 
So in physics, we have the space-time continuum, and we also have quantum mechanics. So we have discreteness and continuousness baked into the very universe. And what you'll discover throughout mathematics is there's this dichotomy. You're always wondering, are you dealing with discrete? Are you dealing with continuous? And discrete has to do with counting. Continuous has to do with measuring. And all the rules are different for a lot of these things based on whether you're dealing with a discrete or continuous variable. And one of the things we're going to do in this class is really concentrate on discrete concepts, which is different from what you've done in math up till now, most likely. When you have a uh, equation, x squared plus 4 minus 3x equals 2 or something like that, and you solve for x, you know, x can be some value which has any value at all. It could be 3, it could be 9, it could be 2.46, it could be pi. There isn't any, uh, you know, limits on that. However, what we're going to be talking about in this class is really most of the time when there's quantities where you either have one of them or you have another one, or you don't, but you're not measuring some continuous value in between. So that's really the nature of discrete in discrete mathematics.